Peggy, if you can give us a wave there, Grant, we can all see you. Um, Director of Regional Funds from the Midlands Engine Investment Fund around the types of finance available and the impact of funds to date, which formed a particular focus for the last quarterly economic survey. And finally, we'll hear from Charles Davey. Give us a wave there, Charles. Corporate finance partner from Bishop Fleming. Charles will be talking to us around some other economic indicators from local businesses, their challenges and strategies for the future. So first of all, a big thank you to both of our speakers. And with a big schedule ahead, I'll make a start in a minute, but one final point from me is that we can't collate and share the information without you guys completing it. So firstly, a massive thank you if you completed it for quarter three, but what an opportune time this event comes up because it's now quarter four and we're collecting the data again. So we will be um, following up with an email. We'll put a link in the email. You can also find a link at the footer of our um, emails. So please do fill it in because I, I think there's never been a more important time that we collect that real on the ground data from yourselves and feed it back to government. So that said, I'll make a start and start by sharing my screen. So that's the first test, isn't it? Okay. Okay, so to take you through the results of the quarter three economic survey. I'm gonna stick in this view because last time I had issues with clicking forwards and backwards. So to start, um, just some information there really about how long we've been collecting the data for. And um, you can see there it's 31 years. So clearly quite a history and ability there for us to plot the data and the trends, which I just think is a really interesting point. What I'm going to do is land the presentation on each of the relevant graphs that you've probably seen in the reports before and then talk you through it, which is on the slide underneath each of the graphs. Um, the reason I've left it on here is that we'll send the presentation round after, so that explanation in writing might be useful to anybody you want to share the document with afterwards. So the first slide is about UK sales. Um, sales and orders, sorry. Um, UK sales have increased dramatically this quarter after the strictest lockdown rules were gradually lifted. However, they still re remained negative there at minus nine, um, the blue line there on the graph, meaning that more, more businesses this quarter have experienced fewer sales than those have increased sales. The UK sales percentage last quarter showed a record low, and you can see it there again on the graph of 66%. And UK orders, so the red line on the graph, have increased from minus 68% to minus 16 this quarter, again with the lowest ever orders recorded last quarter. So you can see the huge V there from quarter to quarter which was UK market sales and orders. So moving on to the overseas market, what did we see in that graph? And it's pretty much the same kind of V-shaped recovery, but as people have talked about before, not quite to the levels that obviously everybody wanted it to. But from the stats point of view, um, the improvement this quarter was from 55% to 17%, following obviously the lifting of some of the international restrictions, and the orders was from 57% to 21%, all minus figures there, as we can see those below the 0% line on the graph. Um, a further note um, in relation to the slide is that the ongoing engagement with businesses have identified that two out of three businesses are not prepared for EU exit. So possibly not a surprise to us that figure, but generally a scary figure anyway. And the common theme with the businesses is that they feel without fixed trade agreements agreed, they're still uncertain how they're gonna be able in detail to trade with their European partners. So moving on to employment and recruitment. 
Over a quarter of businesses have reported a reduction of their workforce in the last three months. And the graph shows this is a future slide. So it's over the next three months a net 2% expect their workforce to increase. So for the first time there, this quarter we've gone above the line compared to a net minus 22% last quarter. Now on that slide just there, which we'll send through, I won't go with them, go through them with you, but we've got a couple of um, recent ONS um, figures that might be useful for people. Um, also some job retention scheme figures. Obviously we know that's um, been extended now, so it'll be interesting to see how those figures play out over the next couple of months. But moving to the next slide, which was about cash. So 42% of businesses have experienced reduced cash flow compared to 27% who saw an increase. So this is a net negative balance of 14%. And that's compared there again at the bottom to an, a, a net negative minus 51% last quarter. Tourism and hospitality sector has been hit the hardest, as we know, um, impacted with COVID-19. 75% of those businesses experienced a reduced cash flow. Many businesses are worried about tighter lockdown restrictions and obviously with last weekend's announcement, um, we know probably since right and even this presentation, how that, that situation has escalated um, and has become really a disappointing reality for most businesses. And again, on the figures, we've got some ONS um, stats there for you to read later. So moving on to investment, um, again, we can see the same V-shape that I think we perhaps all expected from last quarter to this quarter. In total, 36% of businesses have revised their capital expenditure plans down with 17% revising them up, making a net nine, minus 19%, which was investment on machinery, equipment, et cetera. And with regards to training, 34% have revised their plans down with 15% revising them up. Again, coming to a, a net minus 19% on the graph there alongside the machinery and equipment. Not surprisingly, reasons cited for this for EU exit uncertainty, uncertainties, COVID generally and restructuring and redundancies. Um, so final section um, was about business confidence. Um, this was looking over, you can see there, a 12 month period and was just plotting people's feelings about turnover and profitability um, over that next 12 months. So a third of businesses, 32%, expected their turnover to decrease over the next 12 months with actually slightly more businesses, 37%, expecting to see an increase in turnover over the next 12 months. So a modest positive balance of 5% compared to minus 37% last quarter. And profit is following a similar pattern with again, a modest minus 3% net result compared to a huge 40, what minus 41% last quarter. Um, in other good news, according to our coronavirus impact survey, 33% of local businesses have adapted their products and services to cater for change in demand around the new normal conditions. But that said, many businesses are still lacking confidence in the market with no fixed trade agreement with the EU and particular concerns around tariffs and admin costs placed on products and services. And finally, again, as we all know, the pandemic's changed the way that most businesses are operating with increased PPE, greater focus on health and safety, um, meaning further increased costs. Um, and finally, I'll just leave you there um, with our last slide, which was just really a couple of quotes from businesses from various sizes and sectors of, of how um, the uh, virus has affected them and their results from last quarter 
for this quarter. So I am going to stop sharing at that point and come back to you. I hope that all made sense. Um, we are going to take questions at the end, if that's OK. I'm really conscious of time and know we've got two other presenters as well. But those were the highlights from our quarter three stats. And I hope that giving you a comparison to last quarter as well puts it into perspective the real um, recovery that we have seen so far. But as, as we all probably expected, not as high as we would have liked. Um, obviously, it'd be really interesting to see the results from this quarter as well and where the line on those graphs um, are, are going to land at the end of um, collecting the data for this period that we're collecting it now. So I will move on to the next speaker. Um, if you could put any questions in the chat, that would be really helpful as you go along and then we'll pick up them um, at the end for any of the speakers. So please do um, say who your question's to as well. Thanks very much. And I will hand over to Grant. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, just to, while I load up, yep, I seem to have got the technology to work. Um, thank you for allowing uh, the British Business Bank to participate in this morning's um, seminar. Um, and as we all know, you know, these are sort of, interesting times things are changing quite quickly um, we may have a new president in the white house and we're now in the second lockdown um, although some areas have been in sort of tier two tier three for a bit longer so it's dynamic and, and ever changing so within that context i just want to talk a little bit about the british business bank uh, but then to talk a little bit about the midlands engine investment fund um, which is part of the reason we're here so bear with me so um Probably not a lot of people had heard of the British Business Bank uh, before March um, 2020. We were working with 70,000 um, small businesses, had just under eight billion pounds under management. So we were active. Um, we had a billion pounds um, invested and deployed um, across uh, the West Midlands. So we were an important part of the ecosystem, but relatively uh, not well known. Um, and we had our specific objectives were to increase the supply of finance and to create a more diverse market for, for SMEs. And I think the key thing uh, for today is we are also there to help reduce regional imbalances and access to finance uh, for uh, across the UK for small businesses. Since March uh, 2020, we've probably become better known. So we've grown from uh, seven billion pounds uh, sorry, eight billion pounds under management to now 60 billion uh, pounds uh, deployed and invested across the UK, where we were working with 70,000 SMEs. We now have about 1.2 million SMEs that we're working with across the UK. Um, and we're working with over 180 delivery partners. So I should stress, I, most of you will know this anyway, we're not a bank in the classic sense. We don't lend money directly. We work through the market whether that's with the main banks, with some of the new peer-to-peer -peer, uh, organizations, alternative finance organizations, uh, CDFIs, but also uh, business angels um, and uh, venture capital houses as well. So we work through the market to deliver uh, finance. So of that 60 billion, so the, the last data I have, I think is for uh, September, across the West Midlands, um, we have, um, supported just under four and a half thousand uh, companies with C bills uh, worth over a billion pounds um, and almost a hundred thousand smaller businesses. It will have exceeded that figure by now with just over three billion uh, pounds of, of bounce back loans. So you can see that we've increased our uh, presence across the West Midlands fourfold in the space of six months through C uh, bills and bounce back loans. One of the other things that we're doing, which isn't on the debt side, it's more on the equity side, is we're supporting early stage companies uh, through the Future Fund, where the government is co-investing alongside other investors to help fill the gap in the market where um, traditional institutional investors have withdrawn during the pandemic. Um, and we've supported 23 companies in the West Midlands with 18 and a half million. And I think that's one of the, the challenges we face is that the uh, amount of venture capital and business angel finance still traditionally goes to London 
and the southeast um, and the Midlands, both the West Midlands and the East Midlands, uh, don't uh, do particularly badly in terms of venture capital. And that's clearly one of our objectives to try and address that. Which brings me on to the Midlands Engine Investment Fund. This is a £250 million fund it's providing uh, small business loans, uh, traditional debt and equity finance. We worked with um, the local enterprise partnerships, um, including Worcestershire and, and the Mar Marches LEP, to create and design the fund. And it's very much, or it traditionally was, about supporting growth, supporting innovation, uh, supporting exporting. Uh, clearly, we've had to pivot slightly since March, um, and it's now focused on helping businesses survive and trade through uh, the pandemic. But we're very much to focus on supporting established businesses and new businesses across the Midlands. We work through um, our delivery partners and here um, in the West Midlands, we have a number of providers. Uh, so BCRS based in Wolverhampton, but with offices across the West Midlands providing small business loans up to 150,000. Uh, they are um, C-bills accredited, so they're continuing to lend despite the pandemic, um, as are Maven, who are larger debt, providing anything from um, 100,000 up to 1.5 million pounds of funding for businesses. And a new fund manager, um, the FSE Group, who operate across the whole of the Midlands, but it, the same as an investment uh, criteria as Maven, so 100 to 1.5 million. We then have two equity fund managers, Mercia, who run a Midlands wide fund, but it's very much focused on proof of concept, early stage funding, where they're providing funding up to 750,000 pounds for very new businesses, uh, businesses that have come out of universities or other innovative um, ecosystem incubators. And then we have Midven, um, who are fo focused more on traditional uh, growth capital for um, businesses as well. So they're, they're very much focused and based and located um, in the West Midlands. Unfortunately, I, I haven't got the um, September uh, data yet, um, but what I can say is up until the end of August, of that 250 million pounds, we've invested 81 million which shows that we still have significant amounts of capital to deploy and invest. Um, and not only have we invested money, but we've attracted additional private sector money alongside our funding. So an additional 55 million uh, for private sector investors, uh, 403 investments into 301 SMEs. And the reason why there's more investments than SMEs is that companies sometimes get more than one investment, particularly on the equity stage, where you get a series of tranched um, investments. As you would expect for the Midlands, the most active sector is manufacturing. That's the number of businesses we've supported. Um, but we also support uh, life sciences, uh, digital tech um, and clean tech as well. So we've got a, a diverse po portfolio but clearly uh, manufacturing is the most active uh, sector. And then there's a breakdown of each of the individual funds, which I, I won't go through line by line. We have done a initial impact assessment of the Midlands Engine Investment Fund. This was outsourced uh, to SQW and the University of Middlesex. And I think there were some really important points in here, particularly if, as we think about the pandemic and when we start to think about recovery as well. Um, and we run a similar fund um, in the north of England, the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund. And what was significant um, compared for the Midlands Engine Investment Fund was the amount of business in the Midlands who are exporting. We're providing much greater support to businesses who are moving into new markets, not, not just within uh, the single market, uh, but also overseas and globally. And that, that's clearly a, a strong outlier compared to the Northern Powerhouse. The flip side of that is, you know, as your uh, slide showed, Sharon, you know, those businesses have been particularly impacted by the pandemic. So there is a sort of, you know, it's great that we're supporting those companies, but the impact is significant. I think one of the other things which I thought was really important was that once businesses have received this funding, they're much more confident about raising additional finance from the private sector. 
it can be painful for businesses if you're raising your first equity round um, you know the fund managers will ask you some challenging questions um, but once you've been through that process you seem to the businesses are much more likely um, to be successful in raising additional finance um, and the couple of the skills ones which I, I think are really important as well what we found with the uh, MEIF evaluation was that of the jobs that were being created, 37% of those jobs were in the upper UK uh, quartile, including London and the Southeast. So that suggests if we use salary as a proxy for skills, that these are highly skilled jobs. Um, and without being disparaging, not gig economy jobs, these are good quality jobs. Um, and it wasn't just about new recruits as well. The, 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 the final slide about 65% of businesses reporting they'd increased skills in their workforce. It allowed businesses to upskill the existing workforce. So, as you imagine, if you're buying new machinery, new equipment, um, then you will need to upskill your workforce. So I think that's uh, an important message as well as, as we come out of the pandemic. Just re responding uh, specifically to, to the findings of the survey, we've invested 5.6 million from MEIF into the Herefordshire and Worcestershire areas. We know that's not enough. That's why we're keen to work with the Chamber to raise awareness of the fund. We've identified Worcestershire as an area that we want to do more in, and we are working uh, particularly with the Local Enterprise Partnership and the Marches uh, Local Enterprise Partnership uh, to raise awareness. You know, clearly COVID is having an impact on investment decisions, but what is interesting is through the future fund and through um, C-bills, our fund managers are able to continue investing and lend money despite the pandemic, and there's still a lot of money uh, to deploy. Um, there is an issue about demand and an understanding of the different finance choices, and in particular um, around equity and understanding when it's appropriate, what you have to do. And, and finally, just to say, you know, as a part of the work we're doing within the bank, we are collecting analysis and data as a part of our thinking about what might follow next uh, from uh, the Midlands Engine Investment Fund. Clearly, you know, we've talked about exit from the EU. MEIF does have some EU funding in it. That's not going to be available going forward. So working with the UK government, we have to think about what a future fund would look like and in particular what part that may play in helping businesses come out of the pandemic and then start to grow uh, again. Um, just two case studies I just wanted to show you of businesses that we've support. Yes that that does appear to be a Manchester City module so we're working with Rapid Retail who have a number of these modules at uh, not only football grounds rugby grounds around the country to support them in, uh, in other uh, sports retailers um, and it was a job that was a uh, company based in Worcester um, which created um, and safeguarded 15 jobs and helped the company to grow. Clearly that business has, has taken a little bit of a hit during the pandemic but also we recognise that there is a lot of great tech businesses around uh, Hereford and uh, Worcester um, and we're supporting uh, Stockley um, who are based in Hereford with £200,000 who are supporting UK retailers through the development of new digital solutions to point of sale as well. So they're just a couple of examples to show you the sort of different types of businesses we're supporting uh, across the patch. And then finally, I have to put this up just to say that uh, we're not, I'm not inviting you to invest into the Midlands Engine Investment Fund. It's closed for investment, uh, but just to be aware that, you know, there, there is no investment opportunity here. Right, I'll just close my screen down. Thank you, Sharon. I think that's me done. Thank you, Grant. Really, really interesting. Um, great to see a couple of the local businesses that you've helped um, and great to see the, the reference to the manufacturers and the exporters as well, which we know are particularly relative to our area. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can carry on working together to carry on highlighting what is available and get more and more of those, not just West Midlands, but Herefordshire and Worcestershire businesses accessing the funds that, that you know, they say 
desperately need at the moment for their businesses. So thank you very much um, for the presentation. I know we've got one or two questions already, but I am going to move on to Charles um, and then we'll come back to questions later. So thank you, Grant, and hand over to Charles. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Charles Davey. I'm not iPhone, and I hope that uh, my technology will last because I've just been kicked out twice while Grant was speaking. So um, here's hoping. So people are ahead of time. I've got about half an hour for a technical accounting update from Bishop Fleming, um, which you'll be pleased to know is not what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to sort of talk about a bit of what we've been seeing in our client base and the conversations we've been having with businesses as we've sort of been working through the last seven months of COVID. And I think before I do that, just as Grant said, as we all know, there's a lot happening out there. We've got the US, I think it's an election. Uh, we've got Brexit and England's now entered uh, lockdown to today. And I think it's important just to mention it before I get into some of the detail, the government has extended its package of support. We've got furlough taking centre stage, a sort of uh, a carbon copy-ish, a bit more detail today of what furlough looked like back in the summer. Uh, we've got some self-employed support coming through and, and of course the cash grants are there for those closed businesses. And I do wonder with Christmas just around the corner um, and with the prospect of this lockdown continuing, if Santa Sunak will be called on in December to deliver some more gifts to our economy. Um, but these, these are the things that we can't really control, but we can try and prepare for. So over the last sort of seven months, as I say, we've been working with our clients and some of the themes, and I think the most important theme that, that, that we've seen for, from our clients, and we've talked about this at, I think, one of the previous um, QES updates is around employee engagement. Our business employs 400 people and it has been engagement and people management I think has been really critical through through that period. Um, my notes are going. So whilst the physical working environment has changed for nearly everyone, what we've seen is good solid communication to ensure that everyone knows what's going on so those that have had the confidence to either sort of come back to return to the workplace feeling it's COVID secure, or those that have been given the motivation to keep going and keep working when they've not been in the office and been stuck at home. Because everyone, everyone has put in a big effort this year. And, and what we've seen is the most sex, successful results have been from those businesses that have communicated well to engage workforces. And I think as we move into this second period, and you know, as we move out of it, that, that continual uh, communication and engagement is going to be crucial. Just one example, we've we got a client that I've been working with quite closely um, all year, actually. And they've been doing a weekly uh, staff call. They've transcripted that weekly staff call and sent it out to everyone who's missed it. It's not particularly new, but that that business has had to give some really tough messages. It's had to make some big changes and it's been hard. And I think what's seen them through this and engendered the sort of engagement and the loyalty of the staff is the fact that they've been really open, really honest and communicated well. And they've, they've performed better than the rest of its sector in what has been a really tough time for them. And I think whilst on people, there's another really good opportunity here Great senior, we all know that great senior management teams take a long time to bring together. It's hard work to put that top tier in place. And I think in times when it's difficult, when it's uneasy, you need that team to really stick together. And it's difficult, of course, if, if things are hard to start paying these people more or offering the big bonuses. So maybe it's the time to put in some, some incentive planning for them, perhaps a share option scheme because that's a great tool of incentivizing, long-term incentivizing management teams, but it's actually at no cash cost to the business. It could tie them in. Um, one tool that, that I do advise all my clients to use um, all the time, but especially when times are tough, is the short-term cash flow. Having weekly forward projections on receipts and payments and plotting that bank position over the next few months can be so invaluable. It shows the risks, 
it shows it shows the challenges and it highlights what actions you might be able to take to fix those problems. If cash is going to look tight in the middle of December, because wages have got to be paid early and, and perhaps sales are down across November, think about the actions that can be taken now. Tight and credit control procedures and, and chase debts earlier than before. We, we've got a number of clients that simply just sharpen their billing and collection cycle and it has had a massive impact on their free cash flow. And it's amazing that the market is standing it in that sort of level of support and, and solidarity that we've seen this year, especially actually in some of the big, the bigger corporates in certainly in lockdown one, what we saw was um, they started to behave themselves a bit better and, and pay and pay their, their suppliers on time. Um, and of course, if it's, if cash flow is, is looking tight, um, or, or businesses concerned that next year cash is going to be tight as we trade out of this. I think one of the stats that sort of cash is, cash is down to, for, for some businesses. Um, just remembering, as, as sort of Grant said, those we do have the C-bills, we do have the bounce-back schemes, we do have the large C-bills, and they've all been expense, extended out now to January. Um, and bounce-back, you can top up. So if... if, um, if you didn't take the full percentage of your turnover and there's a gap between that and the 50 grand limit, you, there is a one-off one, one top-up allowed to go with a sort of second dip on, on bounce back. And I think these loan, the important point is these loans are priced keenly and it's a really prudent measure to perhaps borrow now and store that capital to, to support that sort of potential downturn in trade or the next the next sort of impact from COVID as the business trades out of this. As uh, Sharon's stats there said, so 37% um, of companies are expecting to grow next year and, and growth is great, but if you've come from a period of downturn and you've used that cash to fund your downturn and keep the staff employed and pay overheads as the business starts to grow, it's going to need funding. So although the, you might not need cash today, looking forward, short-term cash planning it may be prudent to sort of think about getting some funding in for next year. Um, this one does surprise me, um, but we have seen this in our client base is, I, I know a lot of you have done this and I know a lot of businesses that haven't, and it's simply review cost base. Strip out those costs that are unnecessary to the business. We've probably all attacked our payroll, um, furlough's been really helpful, and, and, and obviously there have been redundancies, but what about all the other cost lines? We've had 10 years since the last recession. And I think a lot of businesses have allowed the fat to build. They've got a bit chubby on some costs. And, and I think now is a great time to review all the cost bases and, and trim, trim some of it back. I've been through a couple of recessions, probably a few. Um, and one thing that I've learned from the previous recessions is that it's possible if, if it's possible, is to maintain investment. Um, I know that QES says investment is down, but actually maintaining that investment, if you can, is so important. Economic downturns are usually really short. Yet, if you have the implications of holding back on investment, even, even in that short term, can have really, really long-term implications on business. My industry, the accountancy industry, 2008, nine, when, when we had that crash last time, most firms stopped recruiting. So, so we had a couple of years where the firms weren't recruiting. I think a lot of professional services did this. And now 10, 12 years on, we are all lamenting the fact we cannot get the sort of managers, those with that 10 year good quality post-qualification experience um, in, into our businesses. And we are, you know, in Worcester, we're focused on growing our business. And I think one of our biggest challenges recruitment, we, we, we need the great people and, and, and they join our team as we grow, but we need great managers to manage them. And I think one of, our, one of our challenges, and if you look at just our own recruitment website, we have got a number of open, open vacancies for, for those managers with those sort of 10 years uh, of sort of work in the industry. And, and as a business ourselves, that's why this year, notwithstanding COVID, notwithstanding everything that's going on around us, we took the decision to, to recruit 40 new trainees uh, across the whole business. Um, I, and, and linked to that, 
I always ask businesses when I when I meet them at the moment is is the simple question of COVID opportunity or threat. I know that for many survival is the mission here. Yeah, that that's a fact. But actually, for a whole load more, there's definitely an opportunity to gain competitive advantage when when the market is like it is. Uh, Grant talked about it, um, and I know West Midlands is sort of there, but but perhaps you know, think about exporting. There are a number of businesses that have decided in the recent past, Brexit will be part of this, but also COVID to start exporting. You know, COVID has shown that one region approach, even one as stable as the UK can suffer. So if you spread, if you can spread your regional risk, there's a real opportunity to insulate yourself should one region lock down in the future or you know brexit go create greater sort of impact in in just the europe market there's also the opportunity for an acquisition now is a is a good time for for acquisitions i work in m a and we're exceptionally busy at the moment not actually dealing with distressed or very opportunistic acquisitions but we've got a number of businesses we're working with who are just looking to and, and are in the process of buying good quality performing businesses because they feel now the time is right to sort of invest to grow. And that most of those, it, it's either finding capability. So, so sort of adding something they don't already have to their sort of kit bag or simply capacity. And, and there's a number of businesses, I think, on the other side looking to exit. Um, who, yeah, let's be honest, some business owners have been through this for 20 years and, and have now decided that the time is right to retire and, and, and move on. Um, I'm very conscious that we do want a bit of Q&A and I don't want this to be a sort of 20 minute uh, accounting update, but there are, there are a couple of accounting points that I do want to cover. Um, and I know um, our resident R&D tax expert is on this call, so I heard him earlier, but, but we mustn't forget R&D tax credits. Um, and importantly, if you've opted, if you claim those credits and you've opted to carry forward those losses created by your R&D spend against future profits and, and to offset it against future tax, there is still the option to actually surrender those losses now for cash. So, so rather than hold on to it, you know, a, an option could be to, to, to sell them back to the government and, and take the cash now um, to support the business. And of course, if you don't claim, uh, can, can you claim? And, and as a sort of, this is a bit of a restructuring point, but it's also a very good business discipline. It's about to consider moving things like intellectual property or key fixed assets of the business up to a holding company. It's still one group, but that sort of group structure where you've got the assets, the key assets separated from the trading can just provide a one step, uh, one step risk insulation should the trading business have a problem. Um, and and it, it sort of be heavily impacted. So I know there's a few questions kicking around. So I will I will pause now and hand back to you, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. That's really really helpful. Um, I'm sure a lot of your points resonate with the people um, on today's session, and I know it does with us speaking to businesses as you do. It's great to hear some of your real life examples with clients and they definitely resonate with some of the things that we've been hearing everything you've mentioned from cash flow to then some of the positives some of the opportunities around other trading the acquisitions we've definitely heard those kind of messages coming through as well which is great um but then the skill shortages too so loads there thank you very much charles um so thank you again to charles and grant for speaking to us today and sharing their thoughts um we do have well we only have one question in the chat so far and um, going back to tony's point um at the start and i think it's one for you grant i don't know if you've seen it in the chat i'm happy to, oh you have okay i mean for everyone else just in case you can't read the chat it was about companies struggling to open a bank account and um, with some banks closed the new smes who are trying to get started can the British Business Bank help with that? Is that something you can pick up, Grant? I, I'll try. Um, I think that the, the short answer is no, uh, we can't help uh, businesses set up bank accounts. What we can do, though, and, and what we do is work with organisations who support businesses who can't uh, 
use a traditional bank account. So, for example, uh, BCRS, who do, does the, uh, covers the small business loan fund um, in the West Midlands, they will help businesses who, for whatever reason, don't have a traditional bank account with one of the main banks. Um, they'll talk to them, they'll advise them on the options available to them and can make funding available, whether it's a startup um, or an existing business. And, and we would always encourage, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, some banking colleagues are on this call, we would always encourage small businesses to shop around when they're looking for finance to see what the choices are out there. Uh, as, as I've said, a number of our fund managers do offer um, C-bills back loans. There are other organisations that we work with who offer bank bounce back loans um, as well. So we can't help a business set up a bank account. What we can do is to help them access finance from non-traditional sources. And I'd certainly recommend, uh, Tony, that, that your, your business, your client uh, speaks to BCRS in the first instance because they're a part of the responsible lending community and they may be able to advise uh, your client on you know, what the uh, suitable options are. Um, just picking up Charles' point, I, it was very remiss of me. I, I should have just said that um, C bills, bounce back loans, CL bills, and, and the future fund have all been extended to the 31st uh, of January. You, we'll see where we are in January and, and what happens again uh, there. And the other thing which I should have just mentioned um, is that my colleague, Ryan Cartwright, um, is on the call. Ryan is the bank's representative who covers the West Midlands, who will know some of you already uh, quite well. Um, so Ryan is our go-to man. Um, he lives in Wolverhampton. We don't hold that against him. Or oh, sorry, in Stoke. Um, we don't hold that against him. But he is um, our man in the West Midlands, so he'd be happy to pick up any individual uh, points with anybody on the call. Thank you, Grant. Um, Tony, hopefully that answers your question. Um, well, not that, I think the problem sometimes is not the fact we're trying to raise money. We've got companies that are trying to actually get started. They've got money and they just can't physically open a bank account to start trading. They've got customers who want to pay them. Um, uh, Brad Barry, you, you might have a sort of a, a NatWest view. Um, certainly we're finding certain banks. We just can't start trading. And certainly if there's any overseas involvement, it's sort of we're trying to encourage investment into the area. It, we're hitting the brick wall. Yeah, it, it, it is a really difficult time. Um, yeah, and I think initially all of the banks were closed immediately to, to new customers because the focus was absolutely on supporting um, existing customers. Um, however, we do realise, uh, and I uh, guess all the banks do, we, we have an important role to play in helping the economy to recover. So we don't want to be closed, um, but we are being as opposed to where we traditionally are, we're being a lot more selective and disciplined um, given the challenges and uncertainty into who we take on. Um, there is appetite to take on a high quality new business, um, but we obviously, we've got to manage that without adding to the, you know, the downside stress of the bank. So it is, it's very, it's a very cautious approach, but we are, uh, we are open to, to the right to new businesses at the moment. Thanks Barry. And thank you, Tony, for your question too. Um, has anyone got any other questions? Um, I think Ryan's just put a note in the chat, but not a question. Um, we're more than happy for anyone to come off mute if they've got a question. Thought I heard someone there, but maybe not. No. Oh, if there's no further questions, just to say once again, thanks to our speakers. Um, we'll send round the presentations. We can send yours round, can't we, Grant, as well? Um, we'll send round the QES presentation, but obviously you'll you'll um, see a copy of the report on the website anyway. Um, just a few future things to look out for. As most of you know, um, probably completed, we did an employment survey um, over October as well, and that report will be coming out in January. So it might be a useful document to, um, again, set the position for where we are. I, it was over a whole host of topics around remote work um, and things that have happened within staff, shift patterns, benefits, all sorts of information. So that might be useful to look out for in January too. Um, so if no further questions, then we'll draw today to a close. Um, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. And again, thanks to our two speakers and have a great rest of the day, everyone.
Bye.